Right, so we have, we are at the end of last time was asked what the following have in common, the ozone hole in the Antarctica and the robot kidnap problem. Well, I think the answer to this is you shouldn't use zero probabilities for anything possible. So in the ozone hole price, what happened was that they used zero probability. They said this couldn't happen, so they rejected it. Even though it didn't have zero probability, it was just very implausible given what was known in 1976. And the robot kidnap problem, what happened was all of those who eventually had had very few hypotheses or zero probability that they were lost, remained lost. They were just in, irreparably lost. But all the models that had some probability in there, some hypothesis that said, I'm now lost, let's try and find myself, they're the ones that could actually find themselves. So here's another interesting question. In 2006, um, the International Astro Astronomical Union defined the planet so that Pluto was not a planet. Before then, people were sort of arguing about whether it was a planet, but they created a Scripps definition so that Pluto is no longer a planet. So, so, um, so what happens then is the idea is that strong definitions are actually very useful. So having a definition that we can actually interpret is useful. Um, and then the other question is, is there a data set that says Justin is a mammal or Justin is an animal or Justin is a zolo? Um, I doubt there's anything that says Justin, where Justin is either Justin Bieber or Justin Trudeau, that says Justin is a mammal or an animal or a hozolo. Hozoa. So why is that? Well, it's because we know that Justin is a person and that people are mammals and people mammals are animals and turns out you know, all I need to tell you is that all animals are holozoas. And then all of a sudden you know that Justin is a holozoa. You can do inference in here. And it's also Justin is a person but not an animal doesn't make sense because all people are mammals. Okay, so this idea here now that there are some things, although we don't use zero probability for things that are possible, we keep having definitions of things for which make you know, zero probability for things that don't do it. So we both want to have no zero probabilities for anything possible. We want definitions that make rule out things impossible. Because we really want a planet to be a well-defined. Because then we could talk about that something that some particular thing is now a planet. We see it. We know the definition of a planet. Um, if it's well-defined, so we can ask the probability. If we didn't know the definition of a planet, it's really hard to ask what's the probability sum as a planet because it sort of actually doesn't make sense. And, and so all zero probabilities come from definitions. And what happens is ontologies give definitions and data that's inconsistent is rejected. So that's typically what happens. We reject something that says Justin is a person but, but not an animal. And invariably what happens in those is they're actually errors. They're errors because the de by definition, saying that there is, you know, no, that this rating is out of range should not be a definition. It's just saying the, it's just an observation. It should be possible. It's just very unlikely. And so there's something called the clarity principle. We want all propositions we're going to talk about over a random variable to be well-defined. Someone should know what they mean. So here are some more issues. How can we stop people from publishing fictional data? Well, the standard way to do this is to have standard hypotheses. And one of them is just data is just noise. And that's called the null hypothesis. And you just say it's just random. And you've got to see whether the null hypothesis fits. But we could also have a hypothesis that says data is fake. And there are very famous cases about where people have published data that we now know was fake. Um, even some of the very classic cases, we know they were true, but they wanted to fudge their data because it looked better. Um, there's some very famous cases of doing that. And now the question is, if all data is published, so we're expecting all data to be published, how can we test hypotheses with no held out data? Won't everyone cheat? And of course the answer to that is, of course everyone will cheat, but we're going to predict something that's why we want to give the case, given new data, we want to make, ask everyone for their prediction on it so that we can test what they're doing. So we want to evaluate everyone on new data. All right, how can we get to this semantic science? We're going to start in very narrow domains. We're going to have a few part that hypotheses and publish data and then build up towards this. And users should be able to express data and hypothesis in their own terms. They shouldn't have to be an expert in the domain and statistics and probabilistic program. But they also have to see a value 
in representing data and hypotheses. So we need this pro challenge here as to how we can we specify this. There's a lot of work on probabilistic programming that's trying to do that. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give just two examples of some research in semantic science and then I'm going to stop. So often hypotheses are often very narrow and you have to use many hypotheses to make a prediction. So hypotheses differ, differ in level of generality from high level to low level. For example, a mammal versus a poodle. So a mammal is a very general class of animals. And if you say, what does a mammal look like? They won't be able to tell you. But if you ask, what does a poodle look like? You can say a lot more about a poodle than we can about a generic mammal. A poodle, of course, is a type of dog. And a dog is a t poodle is a subclass of dog. And dog is a subclass of mammal. And we could think about the D level of detail in terms of parts and subparts. The mammal versus the left eye of a mammal. Um, so one is a, a part of it. And left eye is sort of different to a poodle in the sense that you know, arbitrary mammals can have left eyes. Okay. And also we end up having lots of different data sets for, um, for things. So we could, might have a person visiting a doctor. We might have the age, the sex, the, whether they cough, whether they have a lump. And then when they have a lump, you could actually talk about the properties of the lump. Right, we could talk about the leg, you know, the shape of the red, the color, the cat, and whether it's cancerous or not. So we can talk about different aspects of the same object. So we need to worry about in here about relations, and we're going to use essentially the same formatting thing you would have learned about in a relational database, about database design. It's important here. And we could talk about a person with cancer. You could talk about their treatment and their and their age and the outcome um, and the and how many months they were suffering for had cancer for. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here, is we're going to think about how we can actually build hypotheses where we really want to talk about, it might be the case that this data has, you know, that you know, we might want to talk about the properties of lumps, even though for someone who doesn't have lumps. And so we end up with having these rich representations that we need in here. Okay, we're going to stop there for a second. We'll see you in a minute.